Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me and to everyone in the audience for participating. I am honored and excited to be part of this distinguished roundtable conversation. Yep. Okay. For the next 12 minutes or so, I'm going to present a clinical overview of COVID-19 and the heart. I'll talk about the major cardiovascular manifestations, including acute coronary syndrome and myocardial infarction, the role of cardiac biomarkers, imaging, and cardiac medications in these circumstances, and then I'll briefly touch on future directions. So we've learned from global observations that COVID-19 can progress through three stages. The first stage is the mild stage where it is, the virus is multiplying in the body and the host's immune system is appropriately battling the infection. About 80% of patients will get through stage one and fully recover with an excellent prognosis. However, about 20% of patients progress to more severe disease. In stage two, the disease is still localized to the lung, but becomes more severe. And in stage three, this is a systemic hyperinflammatory response by the host with cytokine storm. We often see cardiac manifestations in stage three. And as you will see in stage three is when we start to think about medications that might actually suppress the host immune system. So in this schematic diagram, the black wavy line shown here represents severity of illness over time. If we start in stage one, which is the viral response phase, typically patients have fairly mild symptoms and are able to stay at home with low grade fever, perhaps fatigue, cough, loss of smell. Blood tests at this point may show a low lymphocyte count, but otherwise might look pretty normal. And at this point, treatment mainly consists of supportive care and close monitoring to make sure that people aren't getting sicker. You can consider use of antiviral treatments such as remdesivir in this stage, but certainly we are not gonna look at anything that's suppressing the host immune response because at this point, the host immune response is appropriate. For those patients who progress to stage two, this is the classic COVID pneumonia, still mostly isolated to the lung, but now shortness of breath becomes prominent. X-rays may show ground glass opacities and hypoxia may present as well. Sometimes blood work will show some elevation of liver enzymes and procalcitonin, which is a marker of bacterial infection is typically low or normal. Again, at this point, patients should be managed supportively sometimes requiring hospitalization and oxygen, sometimes appropriate for antiviral therapy like remdesivir. And here's where we start to think about suppressing the host immune system. For the 5% of patients or so who progress to stage three, the hyperinflammation phase, this is the critically ill patients with a very poor prognosis, typically hospitalized, often intubated in the ICU. Acute respiratory distress syndrome, shock, vasoplegia, cardiac failure, these occur in stage three. Inflammatory markers are markedly elevated. D-dimer and ferritin may be very high, and the inflammation extends beyond the lung at this point to target multiple organs in the body. When it targets the heart, we see myocarditis, which is inflammation of the heart muscle. It can also affect the liver, the kidneys, etc. At this point, the most important consideration, and we're starting to see, and I know we're gonna hear a lot more about this from the other speakers, is to think about whether suppressing this overly enthusiastic host immune response would actually help the patient's prognosis. And of course, some early studies looking at dexamethasone suggest that may be the case. Uh, in addition, cytokine inhibitors such as tocilizumab may be useful in this stage as well because of the elevated cytokines. So let's talk a little bit about chest pain. And of course, as a cardiologist, when patients with COVID get chest pain, we're always thinking about the worst case scenario. So we look, about, uh, we look at the type of chest pain, the EKG, the biomarkers, and we think about the two types of myocardial infarction that are most common in this scenario. So type one myocardial infarction is an acute coronary syndrome. This is characterized by rupture of a plaque in the coronary artery with formation of a thrombus that occludes blood flow and causes death of a portion of myocardial muscle. That's a type one myocardial infarction. When the ST segments are elevated on an EKG, we call it a STEMI or an ST elevation myocardial infarction, and that's a cardiac emergency. 
Because patients with COVID have a prothrombotic tendency, this is always in the back of our minds. So they may be more prone to this. Patients with underlying pre-existing coronary disease are more prone to both type 1 MI and also type 2 MI. Type 2 MI is not a plaque rupture or a thrombus. It's simply supply demand mismatch. So decreased supply due to hypoxia with pneumonia and increased demand due perhaps to tachycardia and fever can cause death of the myocytes, increased troponin, and that's called a type 2 MI. Other considerations, as I had briefly mentioned, are acute inflammation of the myocardium called myocarditis. And we have seen case reports across the world of patients who are rushed to the cardiac cath lab because of chest pain, troponin elevation, and ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, thinking they're having a massive MI. And in fact, the coronary arteries are normal. And in those cases, it is considered that very likely they had COVID-related myocarditis. So new considerations, a whole new world about thinking about patients with chest pain when COVID is involved. With the thrombotic tendency, acute pulmonary embolism is another major consideration. And then of course, the non-cardiac causes as well. So we need to use the whole clinical scenario uh, to decide what is going on with these patients. The biomarkers in chest pain, unfortunately, are not terribly useful. Troponin is frequently elevated in patients with COVID with or without coronary artery disease and ischemia. So an elevated troponin level doesn't really distinguish between these different causes of chest pain. So imaging can be really useful. And I know Dr. Goncalves is gonna talk a lot more about that later this evening. Uh, what we want to do in chest pain patients with imaging is to look for cardiac ischemia and to look for right ventricular function and right ventricular pressures to evaluate for possible pulmonary embolism. But let's step back a minute and talk about general considerations of imaging in the COVID era. So not only do we need an imaging modality that will give us clinically meaningful information and answer our clinical question and help guide future therapy, but now we also have to think about, can we minimize PPE usage? Can we minimize risk to staff? And in these particularly critically ill patients, can we minimize risk to our patients as well? So historically, we might have turned to our newer modalities, such as cardiac CT angiography, cardiac MRI. CT angiography gives us a beautiful look at coronary arteries non-invasively. MRI can give us a look at cardiac muscle characteristics. They can both look at function, et cetera. But in the COVID era, there are distinct disadvantages. The mach machinery is bulky, it's fixed, it's often in the basement, far away from monitoring, far away from personnel. The technicians are specially trained and may not be available 24 seven, and these machines can be very expensive. So sometimes these aren't the best choice, and we might look to a more old fashioned technique of ultrasound or echocardiography in this situation. So echo machines are portable, can be rolled to a patient bedside, can be cleaned and decontaminated, and more recently, the point of contact ultrasound, which is a much smaller machine, very inexpensive, uh, can be the imaging modality of choice in COVID patients. Uh, at Brigham and Women's, where I work, we have trained ED doctors, so emergency room, ICU, our hospitalists, doctors, even doctors who make visits to patients' homes, and our trainees, our fellows, and our residents can all use these point of contact ultrasound. So ideally, the provider who's taking care of the patient is the one doing the study. So there's only one person being exposed. And this can give us lots of information about cardiac function, global and regional, cardiac pressures, uh, RV function as well. And it can help us decide which patients might need further imaging, such as CT, MRI, or even coronary angiography. When patients with COVID have dyspnea, of course, we think about the, the pneumonia, the COVID respiratory failure, but we also have to think about possible cardiac explanations for shortness of breath. So especially when there are lung infiltrates and hypoxia, it can be really hard to distinguish between congestive heart failure, either left ventricular systolic failure, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, which can be due to coronary disease, ischemia, inflammation, and myocarditis, or just a systemic cytokine situation that can suppress LV function. It can also be due to left ventricular diastolic failure, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, in addition to the considerations of ARDS and capillary leak with normal cardiac function. So the biomarkers in this situation, again, 
like troponin aren't all that useful. They're very nonspecific. They're usually elevated in all patients with COVID when it becomes severe, and they do not necessarily indicate when elevated that there is heart failure or elevated filling pressures. So in other words, an elevated BNP doesn't help us differentiate between different causes of dyspnea and hypoxia. It is a marker of poor prognosis, however, and it can have some clinical use. For imaging, again, the point of contact cardiac ultrasound is typically the modality of choice. And we always want to reach for guideline-directed medical therapy in COVID patients with cardiac problems. For example, beta blockers are still the treatment of choice for tachyarrhythmias, beta blockers for active cardiac ischemia, unless contraindicated. Some patients are hypotensive or bradycardic and we can't use them. But typically the medicines we know and love are still the ones that we would use in COVID. Some emerging data about statins suggests that not only can they be helpful in our patients with coronary disease and ischemia, but perhaps the anti-inflammatory properties of statins may be useful in our patients with advanced disease as well. Not a lot of data on that. The renin-angiotensin aldosterone inhibitors, such as ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers, have come to our attention because we know that the SARS-CoV-2 virus enters myocytes through an ACE2 receptor on the surface of the myocytes. So there was some early suggestion based on other coronavirus behavior, based on animal studies, that therefore patients who take ACE inhibitors and ARBs might be at increased risk for COVID, and other suggestions that these may actually be protective agents. And I know some studies are underway that I think we'll hear a little more about today. But right now, based on what we know, and in the absence of randomized clinical trials, the major cardiac societies, including the ESC, recommend that patients who are already on these agents should remain on them, but we don't start them anew in patients who aren't yet on them. Okay, I just wanna talk really briefly about medical education because in March, I was at Harvard Medical School every day teaching the first year students about cardiac physiology. And literally one day to the next, one day we were in the classroom doing simulations, doing case-based learning, and then we got the information at 5 p.m., the medical schools closed, and we switched to Zoom. With that, there were advantages and disadvantages, and I'd love to hear everyone else's perspective on that, but it's mainly been really hard. Uh, patient teaching, bedside teaching, has turned into teaching often through an iPad in the hospital to minimize exposure. Uh, in the outpatient setting where I also work, we have transitioned entirely, or 95%, to telemedicine. We have started to rely more heavily on technologies that allow us to monitor patients' blood pressure, heart rate, rhythms from a distance. So those technologies fortunately were in place and now we're using them a lot more. The experience factor has changed as well because in April I walked onto the wards to be cardiology consult attending and the roles have switched because despite being a cardiologist for the last 20 years, I knew nothing about this brand new disease that I had never cared for before. And my fellow, my cardiology fellow who had exactly three weeks more experience than I taking care of COVID patients uh, became my uh, go-to and he taught me so much about this. And together we learned about how to take care of COVID patients. And I think we're all experiencing that, that we're all learning something brand new together. Um, with social media, uh, never to be, I was never one to use social media, but in March I activated my Twitter account and I was fascinated and glued to the screen because my cardiology con colleagues in Europe, in Italy, in Spain, who were posting their experiences taking care of COVID patients, it became a really important, valuable way that we could teach each other and learn from each other. And then I know, again, we're going to talk about clinical research coming up today and tomorrow, but the the balance between our urgent need to know and to have solutions and data versus the traditional peer review process has really pushed up to, to push some publications possibly before they've been fully vetted. So that's another thing that we've come up against with this pandemic. So in summary, uh, today we talked about the three stages of disease in COVID progressing from the viral phase through the moderate phase to the host response hyperinflammatory phase and how that has implications for how we treat this disease, starting with antivirals early on and then in severe disease, considering actually suppressing the host's immune system. We talked about the fact that biomarkers can be pretty misleading in this case and 
pretty nonspecific. We talked about imaging and we're gonna hear more about that, but point of contact ultrasound is very often the modality of choice in COVID patients with cardiac disease. And when it comes to medications, we're still following guideline-directed medical therapy. We're considering statins having an expanded role there and continuing RAS inhibitors and in patients already on them. And I look forward to hearing what all of you have to say about future directions for patient care and medical education. So thank you very much. Okay, well, virtual applause. <laughs> That's always tricky. Thank you, Dr. Lee Lewis. Um, that was a really excellent introduction and extremely um, brilliant overview. And also thank you very much for this important um, reminder at the end of your talk of this other crisis, um, the society space right now. Thank you. Um, we, we, I think you summarized brilliantly what we know thus far. Um, and I would like encourage participants to, um, to reach out and send me questions. Um, I can see them on my screen, so don't be offended if I don't look at the camera and look at my different screen. Um, it's all for you, it's all for the greater good. Um, there's actually a question right now um, in terms of the the um, troponin, uh, the, the um, elevated anti pro BNP uh, values. If there's elevated anti pro BNP with normal filling pressures, um, and if you have any data on that. Yes, so we do see elevated anti pro BNP with normal filling pressures, and it can be considered a biomarker of myocardial stress and it can be a biomarker of right ventricular stress as well as left ventricular. So patients with hypoxemia and pneumonia, pulmonary embolism, and normal left ventricular function can have an elevated pro-BNP as well. So we're seeing it in a kind of nonspecific way in this situation, and it's not terribly useful. Okay. So how can we make sure that all what you have talked to us about and what we have um, seen um, so far um, will be transported in the in the future. So is, is there a way of, I mean, you were talking about the medical curriculum, etc. Is that something where you make sure that this, this gets already quickly integrated into the medical curriculum for the students? Do they learn cardiac physiology or do they also learn like COVID already? Do you so, teach that? So not yet. So the first year curriculum, which is where I'm teaching right now, is really prescriptive foundations, molecular biology, genetics, statistics. And then we talk about physiology and cardio, cardiovascular, physiology, pathophys, pulmonary, hematology, GI. So that curriculum is sort of the basics of what we know, because if it's not COVID-19 next year, it's going to be something else. And if students have the basic foundations of how does the Frank Starling curve work? What is a pressure volume loop? How do you read an EKG? Then we can take those building blocks and approach a brand new disease together and say, gosh, well, taking what we know, how do we approach this? And I think we're much better off teaching them the basics than trying to scramble around to say how to treat COVID when six months from now, it may be very, very different. But what doesn't change is the basics. So we haven't changed the curriculum, although I will say our students have taken the initiative to create a medical school curriculum for each other so that when they go on the wards, what does a student need to know about this? And they've actually done a fantastic job of doing that. I think the rest of us as faculty are sort of scrambling to just stay afloat in terms of our own clinical practices um, and our own patient care. Thank you. And um, we have Going back up to, to more like uh, scientific medical question again, um, do you see any significant changes in presentation between genders? So we've in, all, yeah, go, oh, sorry. <laughs> well, no, yeah, I'd love to hear what you all have to say. So in China, it started to come across that men were at higher risk. And then the question was, is it because they're more likely to be smokers? And is it a surrogate for smoking? Um, and then, you know, I think we were seeing out of New York that women seem to be at higher risk to get the disease, but not necessarily to die of it. I think overall, from my personal experience and what we've seen in Boston, it doesn't appear to have a major, gender doesn't appear to be a major independent risk factor for COVID. In my personal practice, although I have more female patients, I have had many more women get sick, but recover. But that's just my own experience. So I don't know how this gender thing is going to play out. It, it seems to be contaminated by a lot of uh, a bias and other factors that play in. Okay, interesting. And um, we've been asked um, 
we've talked a lot about the left ventricle. Um, are there any impact on the right ventricle? It's interesting. So with, with inflammation, I presume you mean, so yeah. typically when either it's the virus directly attacking the myocardium or the host inflammatory response, it does affect the entire myocardium. And so typically we would see four chamber involvement. We see the clinical effects most dramatically when it affects the left ventricle because the left ventricle of course is most responsible for forward flow. And so this, the shock, the hypotension is most dramatically seen when patients have acute left ventricular systolic dysfunction we often ignore the right ventricle. So we see the right ventricle involved always with respiratory problems, acute hypoxemia, pulmonary embolism, of course. But I, I suspect that the right ventricle is involved as well with the inflammation. It's just we don't pay as much attention. And, and in terms of filling pressure, is there, uh, have you followed up on the right ventricle filling pressure? That's a great question. I don't know a lot about how the right ventricular filling pressure has been affected. I, I would presume that you know, when, whenever someone has an acute hypoxemic state and arterial vasoconstriction, the pulmonary artery systolic pressure is going to be higher. So if you know, just given the fact that it's primarily a pulmonary process, um, I would imagine, but I don't know. Okay. And then an interesting question um, on genetic markers. Is there, is there any indication for any higher risk or protective effect on any genetic markers? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Tricky. <laughs> earlier about why is there such a variable presentation and mortality rate in different countries? Could it be the virus is mutating? Could it be viral load? Could it be something about the populations and genetic markers? Certainly in the US, as I'm sure you all know, and I think this is true in other countries, Blacks and Hispanics seem to be at much higher risk. Now, the question is that a surrogate for socioeconomic status, for a poor diet, for being obese, more likely to have metabolic syndrome and diabetes, or is it something genetically affecting them? Then there's the question about blood type. You know, there is consistently a small signal that type A blood uh, is at higher risk than type O. Um, I don't think the science has gotten there. Maybe please correct me if anyone knows more than I do about this, but there must be something genetic. I just don't think anybody knows yet what that is. Not yet. Yeah. And do you observe a mismatch between hypoxia and clinical status? Um, like patients are less symptomatic than their situation would predict? So interesting. Yes. So in fact, I know a lot of countries, including around here, uh, we send patients home with an oximeter. If they come in because they're clinically short of breath, coughing, they're acting like someone with COVID, we do a test even before the test comes back. If we're going to send that patient home who at that moment looks pretty stable, blood pressure stable, they're able to eat and drink, they have someone to watch them, their oxygen in the clinic is stable, send them home with an oximeter because that may be the first indicator that things are going south. They may actually feel kind of okay, but their SATs might start dropping to the 80s. Yes, we have seen that. It's very odd. Um, and a lot of patients on their own have discovered that laying on their stomach helps their breathing. Um, so patients who are at home have given us a lot of information about how they can feel better and get their stats up by proning themselves, which of course we've seen in the hospital and the ICU as well. But that is, it's a disconnect that we typically don't see in classic pneumonia. Um, patients feel kind of okay and they are not oxygenating well. well that's spooky. <laughs> um, but you just mentioned patient teaching you uh, being at home. So if they recovered and they are um, actually um, discharge from ICU, whatever. Um, how's the follow-up on the um, cardiovascular COVID recovered patients after hospital discharge? So great question. So people are doing it differently and we haven't managed a protocol yet. A lot of patients are going home on uh, DVT prophylaxis because they appear to be hypercoagulable for some period of time, even after they've recovered and even after they're walking around. So considering a One of the DOACs, the direct oral anticoagulant agents for DVT prophylaxis is important. And then monitoring. So usually the trajectory is a very, very slow, gradual process of recovery where they might have little speed bumps in the road, but typically we haven't seen big flares where they have to come back. So we follow them very closely. I have a few in my, in my clinic where I meet with them once a week and sort of Sometimes I check the inflammatory markers and I've watched them come down slowly and their oxygen is creeping back up and they're not proning themselves so often. But boy, it's a slow process. It is a slow recovery. Mm -hmm.